I'm Thomas Allen, and I'm in Nancy McCree's group at the University of Illinois. I'm also a Blue Waters graduate fellow, and uh, I'll be talking about some of my research as part of that fellowship today on rigorous quantum classical simulation of electron transfer in a bacterial photosynthetic reaction center. So, oh, it's cutting off the top. Oh, no. Um, well, that's okay. It's just the title of the slide. Um, so basically, to give a little bit of an introduction uh, and motivation, um, why are we interested in, so this is about photosynthetic reaction centers, why are we interested in photosynthesis? Um, there's a lot of reasons, obviously it's very important in biology. Photosynthesis is one of the main biological energy cycles that drives life on Earth. Um, in addition to being kind of fundamental, it's also a process which emerged very early in the history of life. Um, within probably people estimate the first couple hundred million years of evolution. Um, it, it's, one of the, it's been a power source uh, for a very long time. And interestingly, uh, in terms of photosynthetic apparatus, there are structural similarities, um, chemical similarities and things between different, even between different domains of life that use photosynthetic um, proteins and reaction centers and things like that. So the idea is that we may be able to learn something about uh, photosynthesis in general by understanding different individual cases. There's some degree of transferability there. Um, and of course, there's a lot of human interest and a lot of technological interest these days in improving our, our light harvesting, our solar technology, um, and basing some of that off of photosynthetic energy capture is, is, a, is one route to that because uh, photosynthesis is extremely efficient uh, at what it does. So we would like to kind of understand this in more detail. And uh, so what we're working with here, this is the reaction center itself. This is the, the protein backbone of that. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of an introduction to it. Um, basically, it consists of four subunits. There's a cytochrome up top, which is kind of in the light blue. Uh, and then there's L, M, and H units, which kind of contain the transmembrane helices. And those are sort of the, the, ba the barrel-y shape down the bottom. Um, basically, all the interesting stuff happens in the L and the M domains. Um, that's where all the cofactors are located, and that's where the actual electron transfer, well, the initial charge excitation of the special pair happens. And then that electron, uh, an electron separates out and kind of hops down the chain. I'll show more in that soon. Um, and there's a lot of interesting things about this. Uh, in particular, uh, the cofactors, as you'll see in the next slide, they have a C2 symmetry, an approximate C2 symmetry. Uh, but despite that, only one branch actually participates in the reaction. That's been, that continues to be kind of an interesting uh, thing about it. And people kind of all have their own ideas about why that is. Uh, so eventually, one day, we may be able to, to look at that too a little bit. This is, the, this is kind of the heart of the photosynthetic reaction center. There's a number of different cofactors that participate, and you can kind of see that there's this, this uh, kind of line of symmetry that goes to the middle of it. At the top in orange are the, uh, is the special pair, and that's a, a pair of bacteria chlorophylls, which is where the initial kind of excitation happens. Um, from that excited state, the charge separates out, and we know now that it hops to those yellow structures, which are other bacteria chlorophylls. Um, and then it kind of goes down the chain to a bacteria pheophyton, which is in the green, and eventually to a quinone acceptor, <coughs> where uh, it gets reduced, and then that gets carried off into the cell to actually transfer that um, <coughs> initial photoexcitation as chemical energy. So uh, we're interested right now in focusing on the initial stage, that first excited state transfer to the bacteria chlorophyll. Um, and one of the things we want to do uh, that's interesting uh, from a fundamental standpoint, is to compare the fully atomistic simulation, where we have the entire protein, the cofactors, everything moving around and behaving, um, to other earlier and kind of more simplified results, um, which are based off kind of a linear response model and various, some other approximations potentially. And that, will, that can give us some insight as to, for example, how good linear response is in this case, in a very direct way, because our method can treat both the simplified model and the fully descriptive model on the same footing. So we can very directly test some of these things, which is extremely hard to do otherwise and can't really be accessed experimentally, at least as far as I know. Um, so specifically what we're talking about here, uh, what, what the problem is, though, with this and why we need something like Blue Waters is, has to do with the, uh, the structure of the problem. So we have an electron up there. It's kind of hopping between the hops from one to the other of those residues. Um, and the electron, of course, is a small light particle. It's quantum mechanical. I mean, we had a talk just this morning about electrons and positrons and stuff. We have to deal with quantum mechanics to describe them correctly. They have things like zero point energy. They can tunnel. They are delocalized. Um, and we won't get them right from a classical description. But of course, the environment that this is all set in is a large protein environment. There may be solvent or ions around. There's a membrane. 
not all of this is explicit in our model because that is a lot even for the classical simulation, but basically there's too much there to actually treat it with quantum mechanics, especially for quantum dynamics. You might be able to do Car Paranella or something, but this is, gets very, very hard. Um, so what we want to do is, is find a way to mix the quantum and the classical pieces of the simulation together, and we want to do that in a way that um, remains accurate and rigorous, um, and that we can kind of map back to some, some known accurate limit. And so the way that we do that, and again, I'm sorry the titles are cut off, but um, the way that we do that is something called the quantum classical uh, path integral. So this has been recently developed by a group. It's a, it is a rigorous approach, so we don't make ad hoc approximations. We know kind of what the limits are and everything, and we know how to get back to a more accurate description if we want to do that, if we need to do that. The other nice thing about it, which I'll spend quite a bit of time talking about in terms of why Blue Waters is such an ideal platform for us, is that the path-based description, so we're, so in the path integral picture, we, we, all we deal with is sort of classical trajectories. We just have more of them than classical mechanics does. We sum over all possible paths instead of just one that classical mechanics uses. But because we're dealing with paths, everything is local. We don't have wave functions, so we don't have to ask this question of how do you take a delocalized wave-like thing and get it into a particle-based simulation. Um, so everything is kind of on the same footing, everything is paths, and the paths themselves are independent in a lot of ways, which means we can parallelize this um, in a hierarchical kind of way, which gives us a lot of speed up and a lot of efficiency. Um, and so basically, I wanna talk some, some right now on how this fits into the Blue Waters picture. Um, so the top right there is kind of the only equation I'll really show in this talk, but it's the fundamental um, QCPI equation. The idea is that basically what the method amounts to is that we're doing a, uh, an average over some initial distribution, which is that P term, that's some probability distribution in our, um, in our global phase space and the coordinates of all the atoms and molecules present. Um, and then the Q term is kind of where the pass sum goes, and the pass sum has a couple of parts. It, um, it has kind of a, a prefactor, set of prefactors, and also a phase term. Um, and what we, what we get from that is the reduced density matrix, which is just kind of the fancy version of um, all the information about the system that we care about. So all the electron dynamics is incorporated in that density matrix, and from that we can get various properties that we care about, in particular reaction rates and things like that. Um, and so, right, so to, to look at these in, in terms of what they do, <clears throat> the first part is this P term. And like I said, it's a probability distribution. We can have a number of distributions. Actually, there are limits of this that use Wigner distributions, coherent state distributions, all sorts of a zoo basically of things that are kind of specialized. But the easiest one to use and the one, and the one that really MD is kind of focused on is the Boltzmann distribution. And most of these, and this particular problem and most of the, the interesting larger scale protein stuff is at sufficiently high temperatures and sufficiently complex environments that we, we, usually the Boltzmann distribution is a good one to use. So what happens is we have something like this. We have a phase space. This is obviously just a cartoon. We pick a bunch of points from this and then we propagate those forward in time and we pull out that Q term from each of them. And so to people who know a little bit about this, this sounds a lot like a Monte Carlo approach, because it is. Um, and so that Monte Carlo stage is sort of the first step in a, in a decomposition that we can use to get um, speed up of this, which is, so on the left I've shown kind of a, a node or a processor in schematic, and the blue outline kind of indicates the idea of putting uh, one of these samples onto that node or onto that processor. And so we can split them out. We only need um, one communication for the Monte Carlo, because everyone sort of knows Monte Carlo scales very, very well. And you know, we can show that, of course, that this part of our method scales basically perfectly linearly with the number of cores that we want to throw at it. And this is nice because when we're averaging over this, we need a lot of, uh, we need a lot of trajectories. We need at least a few thousand, um, up to maybe 10,000 or more on some of these cases. And so doing that in serial or on a small cluster, if these are large calculations, is going to take a very, very long time. Um, and so on Blue Waters, we have the potential to even put just one on each core on some set of nodes or one on each node and run it in the time it takes to run a single one of these, which is pretty incredible. Um, but that's not the end of it because the other part is that we have this pass sum itself. And so the pass sum is basically we have some collection of states which describe the system. We take kind of all possible configurations of them. Um, and that's what I'm sort of showing on the left here. You sort of have a forward and a backward state that's a technical issue. But basically you pick all kind of pairs for a certain length. Um, that length is determined by, is basically a convergence parameter. This is one possible um, path on the left where we have kind of in one state in the first step, then they kind of split and go different to a different occupation, and then you have other states that come later. And when you go over all these, you get kind of this branching set of paths. And you have to sum over all these paths before you can kind of move on to the next actual time step. 
Um, <clears throat> and each of the paths kind of contributes to a phase factor. It's that phase that lets the paths interfere and get the quantum mechanics back out. Um, now, the nice thing about the paths, even within this, even for a given initial condition, uh, which I pointed out before, is that these paths are mostly independent, which means that we can also parallelize across the paths, which is what this sort of green line is about. Um, the idea is that even when we have, say, one initial condition, we can allocate a certain subcommunicator um, to just processing the path sum. And it's, it involves more communication because we're doing this every time step. But uh, because it takes so long to actually run the MD, uh, for these large systems, we can bury most of that communication cost in the time it takes anyway to do the DMD stuff. So, uh, and this is a plot of that speed up. You can see it's not quite as perfectly linearly linear as before. And of course, it goes up to a smaller number of cores because we're not thinking about spreading this across nodes, but keeping it within a single core. But we can still get factors of four and things like that speed up, which is very nice because a factor of four lets us go up to a whole other memory length step for the same effective amount of time, which is really nice. Um, and so there's fi one final aspect of this which we haven't done as much benchmarking on, but you can even really imagine taking yet another layer of communication in kind of the, one of the vertical stripes or something and putting in more parallelism because the MD package itself typically has some sort of parallel structure. Things like NAMD or LAMPS are already built to be parallelized. And so you can imagine if you really needed it, you could split that up some more and get another factor, small factors of two and four and things just within the core which should also be reasonably efficient because you're not communicating over these large distances. These codes are already optimized and tuned. So there's a lot of potential to, um, and in addition to some of the things I won't talk about here, which we've developed in our group in terms of um, internal kind of physics-based optimizations and things, it lets us take something that's initially very challenging, doing all these path submissions, and makes it very efficient. So we can get these done in, um, you know, if we use enough nodes, we can get them done in days or weeks instead of months and years and don't even think about trying to do them. Um, another nice feature about Blue Waters for this problem, <coughs> which helps us out, is, is the memory capacity that's available. So we're not using quite as much as some of the large scale MD codes, but because we have many different paths and many different initial conditions, um, what we would like to do, ideally, we have many different configurations of our, of our system. And so what we would like to do is store all of those in memory because the bandwidth is obviously much higher to memory than to, the, uh, than to disk or something else. And because we have to sort of hop along all those different path branches, we have to kind of swap in and out these configurations with our classical integrator. And so being able to do that from memory instead of waiting to talk to disk and bring that in and put it in and swap it back out also offers us a speed up. And because of the amount of memory available on each node in Blue Waters, even if we're kind of operating at maximum density with you know, 16 or 32 initial conditions on each node to try and, and speed this up, <clears throat> we can still usually put most of our most of our configuration information, most of our trajectory information, our internal data on memory and keep it all <clears throat> kind of running simultaneously, which is very nice for us. So that's kind of the picture of what we're doing from a technical standpoint. And I want to talk now a little bit more about the, the scientific aspect. Um, one of the first, one of the things that we've been doing initially with this model is, um, is getting everything set up correctly and making sure that we, we know how we're modeling all this. So the protein backbone is kind of the easy part. That can be handled using just standard force fields, like in particular we're using charm. Um, the quantum system has sort of a two-state representation. We can parameterize that from some things that are known from experiment and from some other simulations and theoretical bounds. Um, the tricky part is actually what I've shown again in the figure is the cofactors, because those have to be parameterized, but they don't really have a standard parameterization because they're not protein or DNA or something like that. And so I want to thank Victor, actually. He's been really helpful in looking through these parameters, kind of evaluating um, the good and the bad about them, and making some changes to some of them that were just uh, structurally really problematic. So we've been able to kind of get to a point now that we're, where we're satisfied with the parameterization. There are improvements that could be made, but sort of um, right now, we, we, we have some things to compare to and benchmark with. So we feel pretty comfortable about where we are with this. So we've been able to move on with that some. Um, and so what we've been doing right now is uh, trying to, again, compare with some of these simpler run, some simpler simulations. And so the way to do that is to do some calculations and actually build uh, some simpler models out of that. The, these are some details about the, uh, the calculations themselves. So we're using Charm36 for the protein backbone. Um, the cofactor parameterization was initially done by uh, Troitlein and some of his coworkers, which is pretty old parameters, but they're sort of all we've got. Um, and the protein is sort of in the periodic box. We've got a 50, 50 angstrom uh, buffer on each side, uh, neutral charges, so we can do long range uh, uh, electrostatics. 
And we've only, right now we're trying to sort of do an implicit solvent uh, model with like a dielectric or something like that. We're still sorting out how to choose the constant correctly for that. But so only, only the crystallization waters have been treated explicitly. This is following some earlier work that was used to get the original spectral density. Um, and we've been testing kind of combinations of forces and integrators uh, within LAMPS, which is our, uh, our ND integration code of choice because it's extensible and we've been, done a lot of modification to it to make it fit with our method. Um, and so I'll show you what the results we've gotten on this so far are. Um, so we've kind of developed, we've gotten out information to have response functions and special densities. These are used to parameterize simpler like spin boson type models, um, which is what some of the early calculations were done on, which is the linear response limit of the full atomistic problem. Um, and so from that, we've done some comparisons to the old data. So the, the black line in the right-hand figure, this is a kind of a decay curve, a reaction curve, which is one of the primary things we're interested in. Um, the black curve is kind of the old um, model from the original simulations, the original spectral density. And the red is using one particular set of our uh, new integrator and, uh, and force evaluation uh, setups. And so you can, and this is kind of at the same level of, of convergence and, and approximation. So you can see that they agree reasonably well in the beginning, especially there's, there are some differences still and we're kind of under, trying to understand right now what the differences are between our different choices of, uh, of integration uh, modules and uh, forces are and uh, get, those, get those to the point where we can get out kind of the right aggregate behavior from, uh, from the full atomistic model as well, kind of on the fly. But we know something about our convergence parameters as well. They're pretty, they're pretty acceptable. Our time step is about 14 femtoseconds. This is a quantum time step. The classical time step is still one, kind of a one femtosecond update. That, um, and the k-max there is just sort of the length of that path branching. And this is, this is something that scales exponentially um, in the method. So small numbers are good here. Four is a pretty acceptable small number. Um, and what we're investigating right now is kind of the, the dielectric. So one way to approximate that implicit solvent is by changing the dielectric constant of the medium. And we're kind of trying to get that right to match some of the previous results that we've got. So uh, work is continuing on that. That's one of our future directions is to, to get that sorted out and perform a fully atomistic simulation uh, <clears throat> and compare it to the previous results, uh, compare it to the harmonic limit. So we can, as I said, test linear response in this very direct way, get some information about what's going on, and potentially also use then the trajectories we get out of this atomistic result to look at kind of what's going on, are there correlations and things like that. Um, we, may, we might also be able to, because of the, the speed ups we're able to get on blue waters with this hierarchical parallelization, we may be able to even extend to doing, treating more states, which will be more expensive, but would let us to look at some other things like uh, the next stage of the electron hopping to the next acceptor. We could potentially compare kind of the left and the right branches a little bit with this. Um, and of course, once this is established and we kind of understand how to combine this fully atomistic version with the, you know, maybe multiple states, um, we can expand our treatment to a lot of other interesting systems like electron hopping in DNA. Uh, there's potentially some ability to look at things like electron transfer in rhodopsin, proton transfer in a number of enzymes. It's also very interesting um, using our method. So that's what we're looking forward to and are hopefully going to start with at least the first couple of those in the next month or so. And uh, I'd just like to thank, of course, the people who supported this research, both through funding via Blue Waters, the NSF, and of course the people at NCSA who've helped me a whole lot in this process and my group um, who have, you know, kind of guided me through the making the, the science actually work. So thank you all.